Hey everybody, thanks for listening. This is episode 17 of the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. I'm Brian Beasley and with me is Dan Alberth. Good afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon. Standard housekeeping. Everything on the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. Nothing here should be deemed personal financial planning advice, nor should it be deemed personal investment advice for those types of things you need to consult with a properly registered and licensed professional. Today, we're covering a book by Jim Stovall called The Ultimate Gift. It's a work of fiction from 2002. To set up the story, I'll read from the back cover of the book. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to read the last will and testament of Howard Red Stevens. Red Stevens was a self-made man who gave his family everything and ruined them in the process. Now, as his estate of oil companies and cattle ranches is divided among greedy and self-serving relatives, one member is singled out for something special, Red's great-nephew, Jason. In a darkened room, isolated from the rest of his family, Jason is confronted by the image of his deceased's Great uncle on the video monitor. This is Red talking. Jason, I lived my life in a big way. I had a lot of big accomplishments and made a lot of big mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made was when I gave everyone in our family everything that they thought they ever wanted. It took me many years to figure out that everything we ever do or know or have in life is a gift. I spent many years trying to achieve happiness or buy it for friends and family and trying to make it and trying to make up for all the times that I wasn't there. I gave them all material things in doing so. I robbed them of everything that made my life wonderful. You may be the last vestige of hope in our family. Although your, your life to date seems to be a sorry excuse for anything that I will call promising. There does seem to be some spark of something in you I am hoping we can capture and fan into a flame. So begins a 12-month quest for the purpose and meaning in an empty life. As Jason attempts to complete the tasks required to receive Red Stephen's greatest bequest, the ultimate gift. The book opens up with a meeting of Red's extended family in a conference room of the law office of Red's closest friend, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton reads aloud from the will as portions of the estate are parceled out to family members. Now, some of the sections in the will, they're written in Red's own words. And so it's as if, as Mr. Hamilton is reading this will, it's as if Red himself is talking to his family members. Let me give you an example here. Quote, to my oldest son, I leave my first company, Panhandle Oil and Gas. Although you'll be the sole owner of the company, its management and operations will be left in the hands of Panhandle's board of directors. I want you to know that since you didn't have any interest in the company while I was living, I figured you wouldn't have any interest now that I'm gone. If you fight for control or hinder the board or even complain about the nature of my bequest to you, the entire ownership will immediately go to charity, end quote. So the point is here, we've got a dysfunctional family and it's comprised of spoiled and entitled people. Now, after each section is read and that person is dealt with, that person needs to leave the room. And over time, the number of family members in the office, they dwindle. And now we're left with... Uh, after each section of the will pertaining to a family member is read aloud, that family member then exits the conference room. This procedure continues until Jason, the great nephew, is the sole family member remaining in the conference room. Jason learns about the ultimate gift bequest that Red Stevens has prepared for him. It's a 12-month project where young Jason has a task to perform every month. And so here we have 
uh, this project that Jason is asked to go on for an entire year. And every month he comes into the office, he's invited into the law office of Hamilton and they sit down in the conference room and Red Stevens had prepared a video. So they'll sit in the conference room and they'll watch a video on the screen of Red talking about the task for that month. So he's able to speak from beyond the grave, so to speak. Yes, very much, very much. Each month when they get together and he has a one-sided conversation with his grandnephew. That's correct. Got it. And Mr. Hamilton can stop the process at any time if Jason is not performing as indicated or if he gives him any trouble. So you have a, a troubled kid, maybe a little stuck up, got an attitude, got a chip on his shoulder. Very if entitled. At, yes. If at any time it's too much, uh, Mr. Hamilton has the opportunity and, and the power to just shut the whole thing up. And, and it goes to charity or whatever. Exactly. So the, 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 the sense that I'm getting here is that you describe the overall family as completely dysfunctional and entitled and spoiled. And I'm getting the sense that this grandnephew who's two generations removed is an absolute example of somebody who's just been spoon fed every single thing his whole life, given a trust fund and hasn't had really had to work a day in his life. Yep. Red seems to have found something in him. Perhaps there's a part of himself that he sees in Jason, and that's why he's singling this kid out as a method. So Jason, he grudgingly agrees to partake in this exercise. From here, I'd like to have us go through several of these gifts that are meaningful to us and um Right, and we talked about this before, just preparing for this. We're, there's there's 12, but we're really going to focus on eight today, so we'll take turns. And, and the first month, the first month, the project is Jason has to, I guess he's accepting the gift of work. Never worked a day in his life. And he is sent, Jason is sent to the ranch, owned a ranch owned by one of his granduncle's best friends, lifelong friends, gentleman named Gus. And when he gets to Gus's ranch, his responsibility is to work this ranch as a laborer for a solid month, working extremely long hours. And his his job, his sole job, this is a huge sprawling ranch. I presume it's in Texas? It's in Texas. Okay. His job is to erect a fence. And fence building is no fun, especially by hand. So his job is basically from morning till night, all day, every day, to work this ranch, digging holes for the posts, installing those posts, and making sure each post is solid in the ground, perfectly straight and level, and aligned with all the previous posts in a perfect straight line. And then wire those posts together, creating the, the this long, long fence. As we'd imagine, there's a huge adjustment that this poor young man has to go through, just learning how to get up early and learning how to stick with something for an extended period of the time. But gradually over the course of the month, he begins to develop some pride in his work. And at the end of the month, he has actually some satisfaction where his work has radically improved. He did a great job and he feels good about that. My response to that is that in my own life, I always, always feel better when I've accomplished something or when I'm in the middle of accomplishing something worthwhile, it just makes me feel better. This, I, you know, when you, you know, you've had a great day when you got a lot done, it was something you set out to do. You did a good job and you're asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow. I mean, it, that's a good day and work, hard work is just one of those fundamental things that you just have to have. When we have uh, important days or busy days, Brian, where we have back-to-back-to-back meetings and the day is completely full, I I get that same sense of accomplishment. And sometimes the day doesn't even have to be that incredibly busy where we did a lot of physical labor. Sometimes it's the mental exercise of having a major breakthrough when we talk about our investment strategy design and we have some mental breakthrough. Well, I gotta say my response to that is it's a hundred percent on point because 
for me personally, if I have a solid, busy day where I have a lot of accomplishment, I got a lot done, I had a big breakthrough, just where I was just moving on purpose throughout the entire day. And my, you know, you, you hit your, you hit the pillow and you're asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow. That's a great day. Even if you're physically wiped out, you're just emotionally full and emotionally, you know, uh, energized as opposed to the opposite. Yeah. Sometimes when I come home, actually it's reverse. I had a busy, exciting, full day. I come home totally motivated and energized to carry into the evening. And it's those days when I don't get a lot accomplished, I come home and I'm down and, uh, I just feel like I wasted the day and just low energy. At yeah, the for, the for sure. I feel better on a day where I have things to do and I'm doing those things. I actually feel way better about myself. And I think that's the lesson that Jason's learning during this month of just learning the value and the benefit and the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Another month, Jason learns about the gift of problems. Here's Red talking to him on one of those videos. One of the great errors of my life was sheltering so many people from problems out of a misguided sense of concern for your well-being. I actually took away your ability to handle life's problems by removing them from your environment. Unfortunately, human beings cannot live in a vacuum forever. A bird must struggle in order to emerge from the eggshell. A well-meaning person might crack open the egg, releasing the baby bird. This person might walk away feeling as though they had done the bird a wonderful service, when in fact, they had left the bird in a weakened condition and unable to deal with its environment. Instead of helping the bird, the person has in fact destroyed it. It is only a matter of time until someone or something in the bird's environment attacks it and the bird has no ability to deal with the, uh, what would otherwise be a manageable problem. If we're not allowed to deal with small problems, we will be destroyed by slightly larger ones. Red's trying to teach Jason the value of problems, struggles, and obstacles. So this month, Jason must spend his time seeking out people who are experiencing problems and report back the benefit or the lesson that's derived from each specific situation. So here are a couple people that he met over the month, the course of the month, as he reports back. Uh, one person he encountered was a terminally ill young girl, six years old. She's playing in the park in the company of her caregiver. For someone constantly uh, battling pain, her wish was for a fun day at the park. You just think of that uh, as far as trying to, you're, you're problem solving or trying to figure out how to problem solve and you've got a, a kid who's dying of cancer. and uh, That's not a solvable problem. No. And uh, they're just looking to have a great day at the park and have fun and play and maybe forget. And he witnessed her having this experience and it opened his mind to problems in general and being able to deal with them. Another guy he ran into was out in the neighborhood doing odd jobs. And Jason learned that he and his wife lost their jobs from corporate setbacks and had gone through all their savings. They have three kids. And Jason told them how he was sorry for their situation. The man laughed at him and said that his family was spending more time together than previously. Uh, and they're doing and learning many wonderful things. And their children were learning the value of money and hard work. Here he is, once again, Jason, is seeing somebody completely down their luck, no job, no money, and yet this family has figured out how to rise above their problems and make lemonade out of those lemons that they're given, so to speak. So far, it's all about attitude, it yeah. seems like. At the end of the month, Jason reports back to Mr. Hamilton, I realized that I have been sheltered from problems and I've never learned the wonderful lessons that the people I met this month are learning. I finally know that joy does not come from avoiding a problem or having someone else deal with it. The joy comes from overcoming a problem or simply learning to live with it while being joyful. 
uh, the thing about this particular gift, the gift of problems, as a dad and having a family, I have two daughters, they're both in college, I struggle with trying to be a problem solver for my kids. And sometimes I just want to blow over any kind of resistance, any force that's going against my kids. And I just want to uh, give them a smooth sailing, you know, pave a, a super highway to give them a chance to go toward their destination. And sometimes it's really hard to, to watch them struggle and not step in and watch them fail sometimes at some of these tasks. And I, I know that like that bird in the egg coming out of the egg, I've got to let them struggle. And sometimes I got to let them fail at some of these little things. And maybe in that failing, they learn the grace and they, they figure out how to deal with controversy and problems on their own and gives them that nat that fortitude to carry through when real problems come into their lives. Well, the truth is you're not going to get stronger without resistance. It's impossible. If you're trying, whether it's physical, like you're trying to get stronger with say lifting weights or, or doing something physical like that, you only get better through the resistance that's there. And you're actually breaking down muscle fibers and then they grow back stronger. And you're, you're talking about, you know, joy doesn't come from having someone else solve your problems. In a lot of ways, I've seen joy come from increasing your capability. When you're stronger and more capable and you've got a new skill or you've got a new ability that you didn't have before, or if you achieve something that was actually difficult, you actually feel great. You don't get that. There was a movie, um, there was a movie about a true story of a Notre Dame football player called Rudy. And throughout the whole film, I mean, we're not covering that right now, but it's, it's to this point. I mean, this guy had every disadvantage in the world hit him over and over again. And his persistence and perseverance to just keep trying and keep with enthusiasm, like just keep getting after it led to just an amazing moment where he's actually carried off the field after like his only two plays of act actively being on the field. He had always been like a practice member of the practice squad, but he was such an inspiration to the rest of the team that when he finally did have him make a big play in the one game he got to play in, he was carried off the field. And that's very, very rare at, at Notre Dame. And when, I, when you think about problems that people go through, uh, you know, in Jason's case, this, this, these examples are all, these people had big problems in, in some cases, way bigger problems than he had. So number one, he got some perspective. And the other thing is they had a great attitude about how to approach those problems. And I think both those things kind of were an eye opener for Jason where he goes, Oh, my problems aren't that big of a deal. Cause there's always somebody that has something way, way worse than me. And the second one is, and even then they have a great attitude and they're finding the good in it. And that's a lesson for anyone is that if you, you've got issues, you've got problems going on, face them, muscle through them, you know, find a way, struggle through it. You'll get stronger. You'll get more capable. You'll achieve something more. Keep trying, you know, figure out a way, navigate through, over, under, through, you know, around anything to make that problem either get diminished or, um, or turns, turn that problem into something good in some way. You can maybe inspire someone. I mean, there's a lot of people who have been uh, horribly injured or horribly sick, and they become an inspiration to other people through their pain, through their problems. They can, they can inspire others. So they can't actually make the problem go away, but they can turn it into something inspiring. There's always some good in any problem. And I think that's the lesson here that a lot of folks, and including Jason in this, in this story, just don't have a perspective on because they're just being a little too short-sighted. So in the third month, you were talking about that, that family where they were, they were tight on funds and the family was learning some perspective and his kids learned the value of money. Well, in the third month here, Red gives Jason some perspective on the value of money, the gift of money. So he's provided with some money that basically he earned working on that ranch, building the fence posts, minimum wage for the whole month. And he had all of, I don't know, $1,500 or something, right? You know, they say money can be, money's just a tool. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. It can lay idle. 
And when you have a lot of it and it, you're a trust fund baby, you're completely entitled, you may not even recognize that, you know, that actually is a valuable thing that could actually make an impact on, on somebody's life and on, on the world when for you, it's a tip or it's a cup of coffee or it's a meal or a bottle of wine or a, an airline ticket. It's something that may not even impact your life if you're that wealthy, but you just don't have that perspective on how valuable a little bit of money can be. In this case, Jason was instructed to go find people and find a way that he could use that money to make a difference in the world. Through doing that, he recognized that there's people out there where just a few hundred bucks, a few bucks can make a huge difference in their life. I can really appreciate that. You know, we had a friend who he was contrasting his, he, he was, he went to a church and he was contrasting the fundraising efforts at his church. And they were trying to raise a huge sums of money to make an incredible facility in the suburbs. It was kind of a, not really a mega church, but kind of on in that vein, right? Audiovisual equipment, very comfortable auditorium seating, stage equipment, lighting, sound, um, all that tech technology, stage, unbelievable stuff. And then he contrasted that when he went to a trip to Haiti. And there's a man that runs a church in Haiti who's full of joy, full of happiness. And for him, all he needed was $200 to get some corrugated tin to put on the roof so his parishioners could actually attend church without being rained on. And it just struck him what a difference. Here you have $200 that's making an absolute difference in some people's lives. And then over here you have somebody trying to raise $2 million for comfort. And it really kind of frustrated him a little bit to see that. Because there was that contrast. The value of money can be, uh, you can lose that perspective on what the value really is. And that's what Jason did. You know, a little can make a lot of difference. You know, and I think we all want to feel like we're making a difference. And in, in this lesson, by seeking out where a little bit of money could actually make a difference for someone, it could be paying for somebody's parking, paying, paying for the meal for the person behind you in the drive through a little can go a long way if you're truly blessed to have that abundance. You, 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 until you really look for it, you might not realize how much a little bit can really make for somebody. Some people just want their cable turned back on or their heat in the winter. And maybe they're only a couple months behind on the rent. It's not that big of a deal, but for, but for them, it's, it could be life-altering. And all you got to do is look around and see that. And I think that's the lesson that, that Jason learned here is that you can make a difference with a little. I think a lot, some people, if they live in abundance, they don't really have that perspective. So that was really neat to see that. Let me go on and talk about the next gift that Red was talking about. The gift of giving. Red's talking to Jason again from that video monitor. Conventional wisdom would say that the less you give, the more you have. The converse is true. The more you give, the more you have. Abundance creates the ability to give. Giving creates more abundance. I don't mean this simply in financial terms. This principle is true in every area of your life. It is important when you give something to someone that it is given in the right spirit, not out of a sense of obligation. One of the key principles in giving, however, is that the gift must be yours to give, either something you earned or created, or maybe simply to give away part of yourself. End quote. So he's telling he's telling Jason, hey, you had some money and go make a difference in people's lives. But now I want you to focus on what can you give other than money? Yes. Jason's assignments to give something. One Every day of the month, he's supposed to give something that's his own to somebody else. Now, the real dilemma is everything that Jason had and has came from the money that red gave him over his life. And so here he is trying to figure out what do I have to give to these people? Everything I have, everything I own, everything that I am is the money that red gave me or that I'm living through. And over the course of the month, he does learn how to give. And here are some examples of things. He gave up a good parking spot to an elderly person at a grocery store. One day he shared his umbrella in a rainstorm, he donated blood. He jump-started a car to, for someone who was stranded on the side of the road. 
He babysat neighbor's kids for free. He volunteered his time and his labor at various causes. He sent a letter to a friend. He donated frequent flyer miles. Uh, he raked leaves at his neighbor's yard, and he baked cookies at a bake sale. So he, he did learn that he had other things that were his to give, and it's not all about money. And part of it, for me, is just living in a spirit, with a spirit of giving, with a spirit of abundance, and having such situational awareness. Your day becomes much better when you're able to help someone else. And what I meant by the situational awareness is you're walking around and you're living your life with your eyes wide open and you're, you're experiencing the day. You're seeing who's around you and what's going on. There might be someone, as you're driving by, you see someone off the side of the road has a flat tire. Stop the car and you go over and you try to help them re replace that tire with a, help them change their spare. Um, it, it's just having that awareness. Yeah, the, the big thing here is that, that I get is that, hey, you don't have any money? Guess what? You can still be a nice person. You can still make a difference in the world around you. Do you need to change how the entire continent runs itself? No, you can just be nice to that person next to you on the street. You can just do something for somebody. You can just be thoughtful and considerate, you know, and it, it just doesn't take a lot. You know, like you said, you can bake cookies. It's not really expensive. You could do something or you could just do a random act of kindness. Each act of kindness that you do builds on the other and creates a habit. It also builds, it sows seeds of joy in your heart. And gradually, if you're doing, if your focus is on others throughout your day and throughout your life, just doing little nice things for other people, you will be happier and you'll have some sense of satisfaction at the end of the day. Maybe you're having a bad day, but you make somebody else's day a little brighter and they smile at you. Maybe that's all it was. But this is just basic life stuff. And we see that in the world. That, like, I still see it here and here and there. But there's a lot of folks that are just living their life with blinders on and they're completely frowning all the time. They barely make eye contact with another human being their entire life. And everybody's an enemy and everybody's out to get them. And they're just bitter and unhappy and sad and mad at the world and every other thing in the world. And the whole world's horrible. And their whole, their whole view is everything's bad. And the bottom line is they're focused on themselves. And they're focused on everything that's negative in the world. But you have a choice. You can go do something helpful. And when you do something helpful, something will reflect right back on you. And you'll start recognizing, oh, the world's not awful. Most of the time, that's going to be the case. And that's, a, that's just a wonderful lesson. You can give other than money. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. Some formal gift. You can just be nice. In a different month, Jason was given instructions to focus on the gift of learning. And he was sent to South America in a remote village where his great uncle Red had founded a library. So he travels finds his way to this remote village and he, he, he hikes up from the road up into this library building and he goes in this small little building that's the library and uh, there's, there's just one person working there, I guess manning the library, so to speak, and he, he looks around and there's no books on the shelves and he's, he's puzzled. He goes, what kind of bogus library is this? There's no books. Doesn't everybody know the libraries are full of books? And the response was very um, profound. She said, all the books are checked out. The people come from miles around to get to this library to check out a book. And when they give one back, there's somebody right behind them who wants to check that one out because their hunger and their desire for learning is so strong that they just they just are, are sponges. They want to learn and improve their lives and do that. And the perspective that Jason has is, oh, wow, you know, here I am living this life of abundance and I didn't even realize I've been taking a lot of stuff for granted, but I haven't been taking advantage of what was available to me. That's a hundred percent accurate. I, I mean, especially if you live in the United States of America, there are public libraries all over the place. There are internet resources. There are public libraries that will, you can rent out books, uh, 
electronic books, audio books, videos, uh, YouTube's available that with all kinds of education available. I mean, the, the, the world is pretty much at our fingertips at this point in the United States. As long as the electricity is running and the internet's running, oh my gosh, do we have access to whatever we want to learn about. We, we really don't have any excuses at this point. <laughs> no matter who you are in America, you, you've got the access to something that can improve your life, some bit of knowledge, some bit of learning a skill, learning a new language. I mean, you can do anything you want almost for free in America if you put your mind to it and you work and you're searching for it. And it's, it's available. The lesson here is just take advantage of what's available to you. Read. Take an opportunity. Read something other than Twitter and Facebook. Maybe like go beyond a headline. Maybe actually learn something like a skill or something formal. But the world is your oyster here. And that's, that's to me, that's very exciting. And that's a very positive thing. And, and we're, we're blessed to have that. Imagine if everybody took advantage of that. The way those people in that small remote village were taking advantage of that library. How would the world be different? How would the world change? And I think that's the spark that they were trying to, he was trying to light off in Jason's mind is use what's available to you to its fullest extent possible. Yeah, what I have found is as I got into doing reading, I've been reading about the Revolutionary War and the Founding Fathers. And the more I read about Washington and Jefferson and John Adams and all those guys, I want to keep learning more and it, it it's a the the fire is growing as I learn more I want to know more and it helps me to continue to learn and uh, it, it also during this learning it gives you a, a better well-rounded understanding of these various situations you said headlines and yeah I I love getting way deeper than a specific headline Headlines to me aren't very meaningful and through this gift of learning and education and uh, spending time really digging in to some of that material. Yeah, you can't really you can't really say you've learned something when you got everything in ten second sound bites from whatever twenty four hour news program or the online website from a news news source that's just doing the news cycle of the day. Education doesn't end when your formal education in a classroom with a teacher or a professor comes to a conclusion. If you're reading and you're really seeking out with hunger to learn new things, learn how to use your laptop, learn how to use your phone, learn how to use apps on your phone, learn how to video conference, learning how to, I mean, all these things that expand your abilities and you to communicate with other people. It, it, it makes you so much less dependent on others when you're constantly learning and you become a resource for other people and you can become helpful and it all just, it all just snowballs because the more you learn, the more valuable you are to someone else. And then the more you can give to someone else and add value. And sometimes you're getting compensated for that value. And sometimes you're just being helpful and it makes their life better. And you get that whole circle or cycle of positivity that can come from that. But it all starts with having a desire and a hunger to learn and not just passively sit there and watch Netflix for 24 hours straight on the weekends and then start your grind again on Monday. There's so much more to life than that available to you. And it's just a choice of what you choose to click on when you open up your device to access that world. You can choose to watch something horrible or upsetting, or you can choose to expand who you are. There's so much available. And it's a very exciting thing when you just open your mind to the possibility of that. And it's, it was, that, that was a really good one. Another month, Jason learns about the gift of gratitude. Now, Red in here is talking about, the, the video comes on and Red talks to him about when he was traveling. When he, was, when he Red, was a young man, he had a, this traveling companion. His name was Josh. And they traveled together for a period of time. And this man, Josh told Red about the legacy of the Golden List. Here's Red talking to Jason. He explained to me that every morning before he got up, he would lie in bed and visualize a golden tablet on which was written 10 things in his life he was especially thankful for. He told me that his mother had done that all the days of her life, and he had never missed a day since she shared the Golden List with him. 
Well, as I stand here today, I am proud to say I haven't missed a day since Josh shared the process with me almost 60 years ago. Some days I'm thankful for the most trivial things, and other days I feel a deep sense of gratitude for my life and everything surrounding me. End quote. Jason's project here for this month is to come up with his list of 10 items and report back to Mr. A Hamilton with his list. So Ace, Jason reports back at the end of the month. They go, he goes through his report. And then at the end here, he says to Mr. Hamilton, what's really amazing is that I could go on and on. There are so many things that each of us have to be grateful for. It is hard to limit it to only 10. That's pretty cool that you get the, he sounds like he's getting the realization of there's so much out there to be grateful for. You and I use the Panda planners and part of our discipline in using that is every day to identify a handful of things that we're grateful for and starting my day out doing something like that is energizing and it's helpful and it helps give me a, the, a positive mindset for attacking the day. Yeah. It's purely a matter of focus. It's purely a matter of, of opening your eyes and being aware of the things that are going right in your world. There are so many things that are, we just completely and totally take for granted, like a deep breath, limbs, our senses, freedom, peace, health, loving relationships, a good friend, a sunny day, a nice breeze. Oh, there's so many things out there that we just don't even notice and are aware of. And that's really the key. Just take a moment and go, hey, what's something going right in my world that I'm grateful for, that, I, that I, I'm not going to take my life for granted. I'm not going to take everything for granted anymore. And another layer to this is, you can kind of adjust this. And I talked about this a minute ago when we were talking about learning, but you can choose the sources of your inputs. You get to choose what goes into your brain. You get to choose what you read. You can choose what you listen to. You can choose what you uh, look at, whether it's on your phone or on your laptop or on a television. You can choose what you put into your brain. You can choose who you listen to, who you respect and hang out with and spend time with. It's a choice. For many of us, you have, you have some level of choice on all that. If you're choosing things that bring awareness to you of the things that are good, you're more likely to feel grateful. Likewise, if you seek out stories of people who have overcome things way worse than you, guess what? You're going to be more grateful. I, I, I'm constantly inspired by some of these people who've been uh wounded warriors, injured veterans and stuff who've come back who, you know, um, Travis Mills is, is probably the epitome of this where he, he is a quad amputee. So he lost both arms and both legs in the same incident in Afghanistan in an explosion. This man, it, I know it's just inspiring for me to see this man and what he's accomplishing with his foundation and sewing into others always with a smile on his face, always joking. He, I know he doesn't, he can't be that way all the time. He's got to have just rough days. But every time I see him on videos, every time I see him interviewed anywhere, he's all smiles, all jokes, and has this incredible attitude of just, he's grateful to be alive and he's had two kids and he has a good family life and he's, he's helping other people make adjustments to their own injuries. And it's so inspiring when you see that. So if you seek out people that have had it worse than you, that have a phenomenal attitude, guess what you're going to be? I'm grateful I can walk. I'm grateful that I can give somebody a hug that I love. I have my arms and legs. So perspective is everything. The next month, Jason is instructed to focus on dreams. His granduncle is describing to him in the video. He says, I had two friends who approached dreams in two different ways. Everybody has dreams. Everybody has goals. But he has, I had two friends that were kind of on extreme ends of the spectrum. He said, one, one friend, he always had these huge dreams that to build places and, and build experiences that would capture people's imagination and just create joy in others. 
And even on his deathbed, he arranged to have all his dreams and plans kind of tacked to the ceiling so he could lay in bed and still see his dreams coming to life and still be building in his mind how he's going to do these things. Even though he's on his deathbed, he knows he's dying. He's constantly dreaming. His, his, He'd have people sit next to him in the bed and say, look up at that. Here's, Can you imagine? This is going to be like this. This is going to be like this. He's constantly thinking about what's going to come. The man ran out of time before he ran out of dreams and he died a happy man. And they had another friend whose sole dream, he was more, I'll call it finish line oriented. I want to retire when I'm 50. Full stop. That's the extent of my dream. Retire when I'm 50. And sure enough, the guy did really, really well in business and had no idea what he was going to do after he retired. But he got to a point where he retired at 50. And he realized all the joy he had in life was coming from the journey and the people around him when he was at work and all this kind of stuff. And he he hit his goal, but he was miserable because he had no dream. He had no dream or mission or, or purpose beyond, I want to retire at 50. And the sad story is he didn't die a happy man. Just too focused on the finish line mentality. If this, then I'll be happy. Well, no, if this, then you're going to have to keep living your life day by day by day. And what, what Jason's response was, you know, gosh, I never really thought about a purpose to my life. I was just existing day by day. And you know what? Life's short. We don't know how long we're going to be here. You better take advantage of it. You better be living on purpose. But here's Jason, his entitled trust fund baby. He's just going from fun thing to fun thing to fun thing. Why? Because he could afford it. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure all day long. And you know what? After a while, it gets a little old and a little stale and a little boring. And Or you have to keep upping the ante to keep getting that pleasure. And it gets more expensive and even more outrageous or whatever it is. And he wasn't happy. And he just recognized, hey, I don't, I'm not living on purpose. It, you know, people need to have... And we deal with this retirees. People need to have a next mission. You need to have a next thing that you're going to do, a reason to get up in the morning, a reason to get dressed, a reason to get out of the house. And you need to do that all the time because you need to have meaning to this. You know, life's not always easy, but if there's meaning behind it, there can be joy behind it. And Jordan Peterson talks about the importance of that. You need to have meaning in your life. But you you also, you want to be like that first that first friend that Red was discussing. You want to run out of time before you run out of dreams. You don't want to run out of dreams and still have 30 years left. That's no fun. But we see it all the time. People are so focused on the day they retire. That's the starting line. You still got to live life every day after that. It's not like you're just going to sit around. If you do, you're not going to be happy. As I was reading the book, I was. what really impacted me was Jason talking when he said, I always felt that just existing and drifting through day to day was enough. I mean, uh, that just really hit me when I think about living life and letting life just blow you around like a leaf from whatever happens, happens. And uh, that really hit me. And it, it leads to one of the last gifts here that Red had to share with him. It's the gift of a day. You have to remember that as Red was making these videos and preparing his ultimate gift for Jason, he was a dying man and he knew he didn't have long to live. Here's Red talking to Jason. As I've been going through the process of creating my will and thinking about my life and my death, I have considered all the elephant, all the elements of my life that have made it special. I review, reviewed many memories and I carry them with me like a treasure. When you face your own mortality, you contemplate how much of life you have lived versus how much you have left. I know that at some point I will live the last day of my life. I've been thinking about how I would want to live that day or what I would do if I had just one day to live. I have come to realize that if I can get that picture in my mind of maximizing one day, I have mastered the essence of life because life is nothing more than a series of days. If we can learn how to live one day to its fullest, 
our lives will be rich and meaningful. Jason, during the next 30 days, I want you to plan how you will live the last day of your life. And at the end of the month, I want you to give the details to Mr. Hamilton. I think you'll discover how much life can be packed into one simple day. And then I hope you will discover the same thing I have discovered. Why should we wait until the last day of our lives to begin living the maximum day? After the video concludes, Mr. Hamilton adds, he says to Jason, when I was your age, I didn't think much about it either. But I think what your great uncle is trying to teach you is that there is a lot to be gained by thinking through the process. And I believe the younger you are, when you learn this, the more quality you will have in your life. At the end of the month, Jason comes back into the office and proceeds to describe his last day to Mr. Hamilton. So here's how Jason's concluding his last day. Then in the evening, I would like to have a special banquet for all my friends and their families. At the end of the banquet, I'd like to step up on a platform and share with everyone the gifts that my great uncle Red Stevens left for me. I would want to have it recorded so that my dream of sharing this wonderful gift with other young people like me could go on after I've died. This one hit me and it just makes me think about living life with on purpose and uh, compared to what we were talking about in that last gift about just drifting through your day by day versus living life on purpose. And uh, after reading this book, it just really uh, hits home again and again, even now as I'm reading it here that I want to live life on purpose and I don't want to be cast around like a leaf on the wind. Yeah. Life is short and we get, we get reminded over and over again, you know, personal lives, but it's, but also at work. I mean, we deal with people for long periods of time into their retirement and we get reminded of that. You talk to a lot of people who are retired and a lot of them will say, I wish I would have, should have, could have, you know, for me, one of the gifts that I I've been blessed with is I was able to, to just be exposed to um, some information through one of the other podcasts that I actually am a listener of. There's been a book that's come out to help people with living a day to the max. So the book is called the code, the evaluation, the protocols, striving to become an eminently qualified human by Jocko Willink with Dave Burke and Sarah Armstrong. So three people uh, combined. Uh, You can get a summary of what's going on with this book on the Jocko podcast, episode 226, that discusses this. But basically what you have here is you have, they've developed a way of evaluating your progress of a day across 16 different characteristics. And there's no way you're going to be able to hit them all in, in the same day, necessarily all the time. But over the course of a month, you can track it. They even provide you with a free spreadsheet that will automatically track your progress day by day by day. And you can look back at that month and say, on average, I was a little weak here in this area. I was a little stronger in this other area. And you can choose how you want to do. But basically, you rate yourself on 16 things a day. And you rate yourself one through five. And they actually give you specific descriptions of what a one is and what a five is. And what a three, you know, and, and, and in between. And it, it's so helpful because you have an idea of specifically how did you do? And simply by tracking it on a daily basis, it takes five minutes to track it, maybe, if that, at the end of the day. How'd I do? But if you're planning your day on your daily planner or whatever, you can also make a, a conscious decision and say, today I'm going to focus on these five things. These five areas of my life, how I eat, how I exercise, did I get enough sleep, but also did I develop myself personally? Did I develop myself professionally? Did I do my job properly? Did I sew into some relationships? Did I do something for my community? Whatever. But it's very well balanced and it's just a great tool. I would highly recommend anybody at least listen to that podcast. It's Jocko podcast 226. And, uh, the, the book's not that expensive either. Pick up the code, the evaluation, the protocols. It's a phenomenal tool for helping people live 
uh, a great day. And the book today is called The Ultimate Gift by Jim Stovall. There was a movie of the same title that came out that's they, they did their Hollywood thing and slightly changed around the plot line that's also very powerful called The Ultimate Gift. And that's also recommended. You know, we, we, we started this podcast up in order to help people make better decisions. And so much of financial planning and investing is obviously focused on money. There's just more to it. The people that seem to be the most successful as investors in their financial planning, their financial lives, they tend to have a bigger why behind what they're doing. Occasionally, somebody will come in and say, so what are you trying to accomplish with your financial planning? Whatever said, I want to make more money. Well, why? I just want to make more money. Stop asking me so many questions. I just want to make more money. Well, why do you want to make more money? They're usually not happy. They're usually kind of grumpy, (laughs) these people. But you need to have that bigger why. What's your mission for your life? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you, why? It's your foundation. It's the foundation. It's the meaning behind your life. It's what gives you joy is your why. And all the steps you're taking toward that why. It's that guy that had the dreams on his deathbed. You do need to live your life on purpose. You need to live your life focused on others because that's where the joy comes from. Even your financial goals. Most people we sit down with, they're caring about their loved ones and their family. It's not once they're fed and have shelter and they're living life pretty okay. Most of those people, if they have abundance above and beyond that, they're focused on what can I do for my kids? What can I do for my grandkids? What can I do for my community? Others. What's the secret to happiness? Live life on purpose. Be grateful. Focus on things that are priceless. And the cool thing about this stuff is that it's not a trade-off. So much of what we do here at work is all a trade-off. You can do this or you can do that. You have limited resources, so you can only do one or the other. You can take risk and get some potential reward. Well, I want, I want less risk. Well, less risk, you're going to have less reward. There's a trade-off in almost everything. But not with the priceless stuff. With the priceless stuff, you can have it all. And there's no limits. Because it's between your ears in a lot of cases. And that's why we wanted to focus on this book. Because it steps outside of just the finance. But gets to the heart of the matter that might lead people to take action that could actually lead to better finances at some point in time in their life. And even if it doesn't, it can lead to happiness. In a better place, in a better community, in a better world. So if you want to make a difference, you want to make a world, uh, the world a better place, guess what? You can. This book's a great example of how to do that, maybe some things to focus on. And you get a twofer with this episode. We mentioned the other book, The Code. So between this podcast and maybe checking out the other one, if you want to, uh, uh, again, Jocko Podcast 226, you could maybe uh, get on the road to making each day a little more balanced and a little bit more on purpose. So thank you very much for listening to this podcast. If you like it, Please subscribe to the podcast. Please rate the podcast and share the podcast with other people if you find value in it. We just want to make sure that more people can make better decisions with their lives and get better results as a result of those good decisions. You can find us on social media, on Facebook, at Fierce Fiduciary, Twitter, Instagram. You can find Dan and I administering a group on Facebook called Investing and Financial Planning for Beginners. And uh, you can find us on other Facebook groups as well. I'm easy to find at Brian C. Beasley on most social media. Dan is also on Facebook at Dan Alberth. Please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. If you have other questions or other ideas for the podcast, please let us know. Until next time, cue the tiger. (laughs) 